SABC, together with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, bring you the final verdict. In the pursuit of justice, we are all equal before the law. These are some of the stories that have led to the final verdict. Every rational person knows that murder is an abominable crime. But when such an awful act is motivated by greed and committed for self-gain at the expense of the poor, elderly and the sick, it's found to be particularly heinous. Well, basically, the way things work at the Western Cape High Court is that there is a court role where every single morning as a court writer, you would go through the court role and look for different cases that might be interesting. Um, and I was actually sitting in an entirely different trial at the time, and one of the court ushers uh, came, into, came into the courtroom and told me, had I heard about this case that was presently on in an entirely different courtroom? And, um, and I was like, no, but what was significant about it? And he said, it's the most bizarre story about greed that you'll ever hear. And I left the trial that I was sitting in to go and see what this was all about. And I was pretty hooked from the minute I got in because the story just seemed so unbelievably bizarre that there could be people with such an enormous amount of malice wanting to commit something against people that were so vulnerable. Madam, <laughs> Hi, I'm shopping with In this case, the fraud took another turn because somebody had to be killed for those um, deeds to be fulfilled. In, in order to get money quicker, a person's life was lost in this particular matter. Mm, I see. But when do you think it will be paid by? Really? Yes, I know, it's shocking. No, this Friday, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, bye-bye. Imali baza wifaga, gule vike zayo. Aibo, sinyala kalaka? Yo, nda kpele laga loko. Ula it kat insurance, uya kawle ezak nezi insurance. Yo, ayali avu ya sat insurance la kubu. Baza patala malini pofu. 70,000 rand. Umtu za fumana, 35 emni. 
In terms of their domestic worker who they planted to kill, it was it was very much a case of initially when they found out that she was HIV positive, they decided to take out a life insurance policy, expecting that she would die pretty soon. And when that in fact didn't happen, they then planned to kill her. The sisters uh, were accused of several different charges. Um, among them included racketeering and organized crime and fraud. Um, and then of course the major ones which were murder and attempted murder. Coming up, the sisters find themselves in court, but can the state link them to the murder? The Prevention of Organized Crime Act was introduced to combat organized crime, money laundering, and criminal gang activities. The act makes it a crime to engage in a pattern of racketeering activity, which means the planned, ongoing, continuous, or repeated participation or involvement in a number of offenses classified as organized crime in terms of the act. Any person who manages or engages in the operation or activities or an enterprise run through a pattern of racketeering activity shall be guilty of an offence. The Prevention of Organised Crime Act was enacted to create additional offences to deal with specifically organised crime. Your racketeering offence consists of a number of elements. Um, you have to prove there's an enterprise, you have to prove there's a pattern of racketeering activity and there are other elements as well. But your pattern of racketeering activity consists of other offences. And those offences are set out in Schedule 1 of the Act and they consist of various um, common law offences and statutory offences. So that is why I say almost every uh, common law offence and statutory offence can be in the end form part of your racketeering offence. When a prosecutor is presented with a case docket, they have to work out a prosecution strategy. In some cases, they may find that there are no independent witnesses and an accused is offered a plea and sentence agreement to testify against another accused. This usually only happens if the state has no other means to secure a conviction. This is done in terms of Section 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Practically, what, this, what will happen is that before an accused um, gives evidence as a state witness, he will be warned by the presiding officer, whether it be a magistrate in the lower court, judge in the high court, um, that he is about to give evidence in, section, in terms of section 204. He will then be warned that he must give evidence which is honest, which is truthful, so that the court may then at the end of his evidence ascertain whether he has in fact been truthful and honest about his testimony in respect of certain offences where he has incriminated himself. If the court then finds that he has been so truthful, it will discharge him or her from prosecution. Effectively, he gets immunity against prosecution, but only in respect of those offences which he has testified about and in which he has incriminated himself. Should the court find that he has not been honest, it will then refuse to um, grant him this discharge and the state will then be open to prosecute him on those very offences um, in a later trial. Sometimes it is necessary to do this because it will effectively um, ensure that the trial is finalized without any delay. Our victims may be so traumatized that it would be um, exposing them to secondary trauma to force them now to, to give evidence in court. The accused may not dispute any of the evidence which the state is going to lead. So it makes sense that we simply enter into a plea and sentence agreement with that person. Um, and sometimes the victim or the victim's family may request that we accept a plea and sentence agreement if such is offered to us because they are not willing to, to go through a trial again. Mr. Kotliso, 
You came forward to the police and admitted to murdering Miriam Zilwa. Please explain to the court what led you to commit such an atrocious act. I, I, I needed money. Okay, let's take it one step backwards. How would you get any money from murdering an old poor lady like Miriam Zilwa? They paid me to kill her. Who paid you? My aunties. Are these women in the courtroom? And if so, can you point them out to the court? Yes. They're sitting over there. May the record reflect that the witness has identified both the first and second accused. Mr. Kotliso, how much did the co-accused pay you to murder their domestic work? Um, um, seven, 70 rand. Excuse me? 70 rand, ma'am. I see. Did either the first or second accused actually help you kill Mrs. Zilwa? After I stabbed Miriam, I, I then ran to the road. Accused one provided transportation. How do you know these women, Mr. Kotliso? Like I said, they are my aunties. And yet you agreed to a plea bargain to testify against them, your own family? They asked me to do another job, and I didn't want. I was scared. What do you mean, another job? They, they asked me to kill someone else. I'm quite convinced that in this case, Bonga's um, actions were a clear sign of remorse. He, on his own, went out to tell his mother without being compelled to do so. And he also assisted the court in getting into the actual truth about this case. And he also agreed that he also participated in the matter. That's, it, in my view, a clear sign of remorse, and that has to be taken in his favor when the court is determining the type of sentence that should be imposed on him. Mrs. Sebuta, how long did Mrs. Zilwa work for you? For about 16 years. How well would you say you knew her? Very well. She was like family to us. When we were younger, she worked for our parents. She, she was like an aunt. And when did you and your sister, accused number two, take out the insurance policy on Miriam Zilla's name? Last year, when we found out she was HIV positive. Why? We thought we would make sure her family would be provided for in case she were to die. And how have you provided for her family since her death? We paid for all the funeral arrangements, which would have left them penniless. Obviously, you cared for this woman. Then why is the state alleging that you asked your nephew to kill Mrs. Zilwa? We would never ask anyone to do such a disgusting thing. He shames our family. When he was younger, he would often come and stay with us when his father got too drunk. He was such a sweet boy. But in the past year, we've barely seen him. He's made friends with some local gangs that we think deal drugs. We've always feared that he might become like his father, but we never thought, we, we never thought he would. <laughs> what we found in the past was that when your domestic worker, your gardener pass away, the family usually come to you as the, as the provider um, to, to assist with the funeral expenses. So it's not um, uncommon for a employer to take out funeral uh, cover or disability cover for their employees. What does raise suspicion is the circumstances of the death. 
how it was committed, how long did the person work for you, was the employer aware of, of the non-disclosure um, of, of the medical health, um, etc. So that type of thing would raise suspicion. Coming up, will a gruelling cross-examination shed light on the heinous murder? Why did Miriam Zilwa list you and your sister as her beneficiaries on the insurance policy and not one of her own children? She was like family to us. And besides, we paid for it. Yes, you paid for the policy. So you wanted to receive the rewards when she died? No, it was to help her family. Okay then, apart from paying for the funeral, have you given them any more of the money? No. Why not? You were paid over 70,000 rand, and the funeral, as reported by the family, cost just under 10,000 rands. What have you done with the remainder? Nothing. We, we've just been busy. You've just been busy? Mrs. Sibuta, you were aware that the amount payable would double if the insured were to die of unnatural causes. Were you not? No. It was clearly stated in the contract you signed. Well, I didn't see it. Really? Yes. It was also important for the organized criminals in this case um, to ensure that the person, instead of dying through natural causes, dies as, as if it was an accident to guarantee a substantial higher amount of money. Mrs. Sibut, you say you've hardly seen your nephew Bonga in the past year. Yes. But he was seen at your house two days after the murder? Well, we were not home. Then why did one of your neighbors testify that he left with a packet he didn't have when he first came into the house? I don't know. Again? How nice of you to wash the blood stains out of his soiled clothes. That's not true. In April last year, did you and your sister receive a payout from another insurance policy? Yes. What was that for? For our cousin who passed away. Was he or she HIV positive? Yes, yes he was. How did he die? He was involved in a hit and run. And a pattern emerges. You ensure the weak and destitute, and then they miraculously die. I have no further questions, my lady, not that the accused answered many of them. Misleading the court and outright dishonesty as it was um, displayed by the other witnesses in this, in this case can be an aggravating factor because it's an indication that these people are hardened criminals, but also they're not going to be easily rehabilitated. And the court doesn't take kind um, to this type of, um, of behavior. In this instance, um, it was also quite clear that the accused were involved in a series of other related matters which showed a pattern of criminal behavior on their part. It was clear that they were doing this on an organized basis. Um, apart from the lady who died or who was killed, they also tried to uh, kill somebody else where they didn't succeed, where they'd also taken out a policy. So they were acting on an ongoing, organized manner. Uh, that is why we used the uh, Prevention of Organized Crime Act. On the charge of the murder of Miriam Zilwa, I find the first accused, Natalie Sabuta, guilty. The second accused, Sine Nena, wasn't present at the scene of the crime. 
due to the fact that she was in the company of her sister around the time of the murder and that she signed the insurance policy prior to the murder, she too is found guilty on the charge of murder. On the charge of fraud, I find Sini Nene and Natalie Sabuta guilty in that they unlawfully and intentionally caused the death of Miriam Zilwa so that they could receive the insurance payout. Although there isn't sufficient evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt that either of the accused were responsible for their cousin's death, accused one and accused two did work together in taking out the insurance policy as well as plan the murder of Miriam Zilwa. This leads me to believe that on the dual charges of managing and conducting an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activities, respectively, I find both the accused guilty. In a criminal case, the court can only convict if the state has proven its case beyond reasonable doubt. This is a higher standard of proof um, than ordinary because at the center of justice, it is important um, to note that in actual fact, it's better to have the guilty walking up and down the street than to have the innocent confined in jail for many years. These crimes are utterly reprehensible. And I find your callous taking advantage of the weak and the young to be particularly repugnant. They were taking advantage of people that were in very vulnerable positions. Um, people who knew them very well. And I think it wasn't only repugnant to the judge, it was re re repugnant to most people that people in that kind of position get taken advantage of by people who are very much more well off. The judge chastised um, Natalie and Sine, and correctly so, because vulnerable and weak people need our protection and nurturing. Um, it is important to understand that vulnerable people are generally susceptible to exploitation because of their defenseless position and also because they are trusting on people like Natalie and Sine. So their act in this instance is simple, an act of cowardice, and I dare say a dastard deed, which the judge correctly frowned upon. The offense of fraud occurs when someone makes a false representation while knowing it to be false. This must be done with the intention that the person to whom it is made will act upon such misrepresentation to their detriment. Organized crime includes offenses committed by a group of individuals, such as money laundering and managing and conducting a criminal enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activities. The final verdict was brought to you by SABC together with the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development.